Hey guys, welcome to another episode of NetSec Now. Today we are going to discuss the recon stage of the four phases of network security auditing and penetration testing. So, let's read the disclaimer. Any information disclosed in this series is provided for the sole purpose of learning network security. We take no responsibility for any misuse of any information we provide. We only suggest you audit systems that you have permission on or otherwise in your virtual lab. Moving forward. So we discussed the phases of penetration testing, right? There's an internal audit and an external audit. Well, in the last video, we went over the information gathering stage, doing your homework. And we used quite a few examples of just how much information people put out online, which is insane, if you ask me, in today's day and age. Well, today we're going to get into the recon stage, and we are going to build a case against a said client. Now, today we're going to be using... Uh, our lab as an internal audit. Uh, we're going to be emulating an internal audit uh, and it's really just simpler to understand how some of the tools work and how to read results and things like that. So let's move forward. So the types of audits we know there's an external outside of the local area network uh, audit that's a WAN to WAN audit. Uh, there's an internal audit of course that means inside of the local area network. Uh, sometimes you would do this for PCI uh, compliancy and, and stuff like that. Uh, then of course vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, and security policy auditing. Well today we're going to go over like I said the internal audit of it just to get you guys familiar with some of the tools and how to use them, how to read uh, results, and you know how to put the ca uh, case together for, for your customer. Okay so recon, staying quiet, ninja mode engaged. Well of course anytime we're doing a penetration test we always want to stay as quiet as possible right even when we're doing internal audits they know they're there, we're there I mean we're physically sitting inside their building right so um, you still want to stay quiet you don't want to try to disrupt the network traffic you don't want to you know fire off things that are going to really disrupt their uh, their business and most of the time you're doing internal audits when they're actually there. We would want to try to do external audits when they're not there just in case so there's no service interruption. So of course we're going to do some port scanning uh, and enumeration and basically we're going to enumerate the hosts that are on the network, uh, check their ports, see what's open, see what's not. Uh, you know we're going to just basically do service discovery and identification based upon those ports and what's running on them. Uh, and Nmap we're going to be using as well. Uh, we're going to skip the social engineering phase one because that's really for the external audit as we showed in the information gathering uh, stage of phases of network security auditing. So that, that's not really going to apply today, but uh, vulnerability scanning will use OpenVOS, of course. Uh, verification, logic, check, check, and check again. Guys, I can't drive that home enough. Use logic. It is very important. So then we're going to put it all together and build a case. So recon, tools of trade, logical thinking, of course, and guys, I'll keep driving that home. Planning is key. You need to have a good plan in order to do a successful audit. So for port scanning, we're going to be using Nmap primarily. Uh, HPing 3, we'll get into in the advanced series for doing like firewall IDS, IPS evasion techniques. Um, Netcat, you know, we'll do a brief overview of it, but, um, you know, really Nmap is are going to be our go-to guy for port scanning and service discovery. So, of course, the vulnerability scanners, there's a, a different uh, few of them. OpenVOS, of course, we spoke about in some, uh, some instances. There is Nessus, of course. We won't be using that because I'm not really a big fan of the way Nessus went with their paid version versus their community version. Um, we'll touch a little bit on Metasploit and Armitage today. We're not going to get into web scanners, obviously. Uh, that's more of an external type of audit. Um, we're going to be using Telnet banner grabbing for verification of services that we find. And of course, RFC port checking, really all that means is, is checking it out online. What port is port, you know, 8080 used for. Um, you know, we might touch on that just a little bit. And uh, case file software, guys, you could use Notepad. Um, you can use case file, which is included in Kali Linux, but, uh, you know, I'm not really a big fan of that. Uh, in fact, what I would recommend you doing is installing OpenOffice. Um, and if you need help with that, just post uh, on our forums, and I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, respond to you. Actually, I might just make a topic on the forums uh, regarding that, because OpenOffice is really great. That's what I use to make these slideshows and presentations and, you know, uh, build reports and stuff like that. Uh, it's like Office for Windows, but it's free. So anyway, moving forward, let's get out of here and fire up our Kelly Linux box, which we conveniently already have going. So the first things first, if you're doing an internal audit and you're on a customer's network, you're either hardwired in, plugged into a switch somewhere, or you're you know part of their wireless network, okay? 
one thing to be aware of is some of the larger organizations may have VLANs or virtual LAN segments in place with a managed switch. So you have to know about that before you start your internal audit, okay? So the first thing first, we want to check our IP address to see where we're at on the network. Now, this is just going to be emulating, obviously, a small network, but this would apply to most networks. Okay, so just open up a terminal and find out what your IP address is. It's IFCONFIG. Okay, so we know we're hardwired here on ETHO. Okay, and then our IP address is 192.168.1.2. Okay, so let's just clear out the screen here. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to find out how many hosts or IP addresses are on this subnet. How many hosts are actually alive? So we don't want to spend time putting, you know, a whole crazy range of IP addresses into Nmap and waiting. You know, if they had like a class B subnet, we could be there for hours just waiting for results to, you know, come through. Um, so we really want to find just the alive host. That's the ones we're going to be, you know, pursuing after. And that's the ones that we're really going to be checking out. Okay, so... There's a neat little tool included in Kali Linux uh, that allows you to use, or basically kind of exploit the NetBIOS name service, right, to um, show you what's going on. And just to give you a brief overview so you know what we're talking about here, um, what our virtual lab network actually looks like, let's go over to our Proxmox machine. And you can see here we have a Windows XP Pro Service Pack 3 machine running here. Okay, uh, that one actually did some automatic updates on accident. I forgot to turn that off. So that's okay. It actually works out better in our favor because there's going to be some times where you're on a network, you're doing an internal audit against, you know, the Windows machines that are on the network. And most of them might be patched and updated, so they may not be vulnerable. But more than likely, you're going to find at least one that was skipped over and not paid attention to. The updates failed for whatever reason, whatever. And you might just find yourself a vulnerable host. Okay, and that's that's what our job is to do. You know, it, it's not to make sure that we find one every single time. It's just to make sure that we find ones that are vulnerable. And if there aren't any ones that are vulnerable, give them the thumbs up, give them a good report. You're good to go. Have a nice day. But if you do find ones that are vulnerable, hey, look, machine on this IP address with NetBIOS name, whatever, is vulnerable. Take care of it. Okay. So um, we haven't met a spoilable box, but uh, you know that's not started up, of course. Uh, we have a Windows Server 2003 Standard Edition um, domain controller, which is doing Active Directory and DNS. Uh, it's not doing DHCP or anything crazy. We'll let the router handle that for simplicity's sake. Um, but uh, you know, that's uh, you'll still find those in in most organizations these days. Even though we're up against uh, Windows Server 2008 uh, these days, and you know, uh, the logistics of it, the background of it uh, is all the same as Active Directory, right? So there's no big crazy changes, okay? So this will apply uh, to most anything. Uh, and then we have the next here in line, we have a Windows 7 Ultimate box, which is really a Windows 7 professional box. Now, when you go into networks, you may find a lot of the times there's mixed networks. They have some Windows 7 hosts, they have some Windows XP hosts, they have some, you know, uh, hosts that are like Windows 98. Uh, and the reason being is because they, you know, if they're a manufacturing company specifically, uh, those guys usually have, you know, proprietary software that was created for Windows 98 and it only runs on Windows 98 and it cannot be emulated any other way. So you may find a Windows 98 box um, that's either physical or up in a VM somewhere hiding on the network, okay? So um, be prepared for that. You, you may find some old stuff out there. Okay, so, uh, and then also in our information gathering, um, you know, tutorial we did, again, look at what type of business they're in. If they're a manufacturing company, look what types of software manufacturing companies use. For instance, if they're manufacturing a special kind of widget, you would do a Google search for, you know, manufacturing that type of widget software. And you'll see, like, you know, maybe there's only a handful of companies and a good majority of them are still, you know, the system requirements are Windows 98 and Windows 95. It may not be for XP, right? So, again, that's why it's important to do your homework. Okay, so anyway, moving forward. So we have those three machines out on the network here. Let's go back to our Kali Linux box. We already found out our IP address. Now, building a case starts from the very gate. As soon as you're in the network and you're ready to begin your, your pen test or your security audit, you need to have stuff in order. You need to organize things, right? So the simple way to do that is just to make a directory and name it after that client, right? So we're just going to issue the make directory can, uh, command, mkdir, and we're going to call this Acme Inc., right? So we'll just make it here in, in the root directory. Okay. So you can see we have the directory now, Acme Inc., right? 
So let's go ahead and CD into there because that's going to be our working directory for the most uh, most part. Okay. Now let's clear out the screen so we're not confused. Okay. Moving forward. So again, I, I mentioned this really cool tool that uh, Kali Linux has in it. It's called NBT Scan, and what that does is basically exploit, uh, you know, the, the NetBIOS name service and you know sharing and stuff that Windows likes to use on their network uh, to share files amongst themselves, so on and so forth. Well, this tool will actually scan and check all the live hosts. It'll give you their NetBIOS name. It'll give you whether they're a server or not, and it will also give you their MAC address. So the command is NBT Scan, and you could always use the autocomplete tab key to uh, issue any command that you know is there, save yourself a little bit of time. So let's just uh, hit enter and take a look at some of their options they have in here. And you can see there's a lot, right? So scrolling all up to the top here, you have Verberos. And you know, whenever a, an application gives you an option to use Verberos, you wanna see what's going on. You want as much detail and information as possible, right? So you always use a V uh, for Verberos. Uh, in this case, we're not gonna do it. I mean, it's, it's kind of neither here nor there uh, since it's such a small lab that we're working on here, right? So then you got the uh, TAC D options for dump packets, print uh, whole packet contents. We don't really need any of that unless you're doing debugging. You can set your bandwidth throttling and stuff like that. You don't really need that. You can set uh, timeout values for milliseconds response on a timeout. What we're really going to be focused on here is the dash R switch or the TAC R switch. But if you read the description here, it says use local port 137 for scans, win 95 boxes responses only. That's not exactly true. And the reason being is because um, Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows Server 2003, Windows Server 2008, anything that uses NetBIOS will respond to this. So maybe this was written a long time ago and, you know, maybe they made a mistake, who knows. But um, in my testing, I know that that actually works, right? So you can see some examples down here towards the bottom. And this is the example we're going to be using here, scans whole Class C subnet or Class C network in this case. Okay. So... Um, if you have like a class B or something like that, you know, obviously it's going to it's going to go against that whatever IP address you put in. Now, if you look at the next one under here, if you knew, say, for instance, there was only, you know, 100 IPs being used out of the class C or class B subnet and it started at uh, 192.168.2 to dot, you know, 101 or something like that. Well, obviously, you don't want to scan, you know, all 255 available address spaces, so you can specify just a range, a small range, if you wanted to. Well, me, I mean, I know we only have three alive hosts on this uh, lab network here for this exercise, so I'm just going to do the MBT-R scan, okay? And then, of course, if you want to read up more on this stuff, by all means, feel free to do it on your time. Uh, we're not going to go through all this because this really means nothing to us. We're looking at the MBT-R, okay? So... Clear the screen out here. So it's NBT, oops, NBT scan dash R, right? Lowercase R, and then 192.168.1, oops, dot one dot zero. That's our starting range, and we want to go all the way up to dot 255. So we're going to do slash 24 for the CIDR, right? So it's short instead of typing out, uh, you know, TAC 255. Okay. Now I want to start getting you guys used to piping things out to a text file. So it's either easily greppable later if you want to search through that file and pick out certain things, and, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit. Um, but it's also just to have everything organized in one file, right? And then later on, we'll break it apart and we'll, you know, maybe use a template. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll create a template for you guys and upload it to the website you can download to use for your pen test. So you, you know, you know what you're putting in your port scan results here and exploits results here and so on and so forth, right? So for now, just for this exercise, we're just going to build a basic text file. So anything you, anytime you want to pipe something out to a text file for the very first time, you're going to use the one greater than less than symbol, okay? And then the file that you want to create. So we're just going to name this um, results.txt, okay? So if you wanted to append, and we're going to show you that in the next command using nmap, if you want to append to the end of a current existing file, you have to use two greater than less than symbols. And we'll show you that here in just a minute. So let's fire off this command here. And in just a moment here, it should uh, have outputted to a results.txt file. Okay, good. So let's just make sure that file exists and let's go ahead and cat out that file. And you can see. So let's take a look at some of these results and read what they mean. Okay, so you have your uh, meanings up here for your, you know, rows. So it's IP address, NetBIOS name, server, user, MAC address. Okay. So going through here, 
192.168.1.2, well, that was our IP address as we learned in IF config in the very first start of this whole thing. So we know that that's not going to give us a NetBIOS name because we're not doing any NetBIOS on uh, Kelly Linux, right? And so we don't have to pay attention to that. The next one down here, 192.168.1.3, desktop 1, says it's a server. And it will only say that usually because it has some sort of file sharing enabled, NetBIOS, something like that. And it says user unknown because it couldn't guess a user. And then it has the MAC address. Well, this machine in particular, Desktop 1, I know is the machine that we're actually using to uh, do this demonstration off of, and that's the machine that hosts our Kali Linux VM. Okay, So I'm not going to worry about that one. What I'm looking for here is these three IP addresses, of course, again, uh, according to our Proxmox virtual machine server that we have for the lab, you know that these are the three boxes that are running on there, right? There's a domain controller, then there's a Windows 7 box and a Windows XP box. Okay, so let's take a look at the results here. Uh, 192.168.1.9, Acme Inc. PDC. Well, gee, I wonder what that could be, right? So it says it's a server type and it's giving us a MAC address. Now the MAC address is important to have in case we needed to do some sort of ARP spoofing or some sort of MAC spoofing, something like that. I mean, we may want to have that for later on. Okay, so uh, moving down the list here, 192.168.1.8 is an XP Pro 01, as we saw in our Proxmox box. Of course, you wouldn't see that if you were doing this live, but uh, we can tell that that's an XP box uh, server because, of course, it has NetBIOS enabled. Uh, and then the MAC address here, and then we look at the next one here, 192.168.1.7, and it says jadams-pc. Well, in organizations, that's more than likely what you're going to find, um, you know, because that's what admins like to name their boxes, you know. Y you'll get the idea. So, it says server type, of course, user unknown, and again, here's the MAC address, something that's definitely important for us to have. So now you can see when we catted out the results.txt file, we have this information in it. Well, okay, so we know that the three IP addresses that we're after here is dot seven through dot nine, right? So now we need to find out what open ports are available on these hosts. Well, we know that something's got to be up with NetBIOS. NetBIOS has got to be enabled, but we want to double check, right? So we want to run a, a port scan against these three boxes, and we're going to use NMAP to do that. So let me clear out this screen. Okay, so NMAP is a very intuitive, very powerful port scanning application. Not only does it just scan ports, but it has so many different options to it. In fact, there's books written specifically on NMAP. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, we will get into advanced NMAP techniques in the advanced series for uh, firewall IDS IPS evasion techniques from the outside, uh, an external audit or a WAN to WAN audit, right? So for this demonstration here, we don't really need to specify too many crazy switches that uh, you, you could use inside of NMAP. I mean, just if you did and map and hit enter to look at the uh, all the options. I mean, you can see that there is hundreds of options that you can input in here, different flags, so on and so forth. I mean, this is really um, an advanced tool to use. But for time's sake here and for uh, ease of learning, we're just going to issue a one flag. Okay, so the thing with nmap is that you can enter in an IP address range, much like as we did in NVT scan or you can issue in uh, certain IP addresses, right? So if you know there's only three IPs on the whole entire network, you're not going to want to scan all the empty ones that aren't, you know, alive, right? So the command goes as such, nmap dash or TAC capital A, that's for the host discovery, right? If you notice up in here, there was a different option for host discovery as well, but I use TAC capital A. You know, I'm not going to fish through all this stuff here, but NMAP, you can spoof IP addresses. I mean, it's it's intense, and we'll get on, and we'll, we're actually probably just going to do a separate tutorial just on NMAP it, itself, because it's so intense. Okay, so NMAP space TAC capital A for host discovery, okay? Now, we're going to enter in our IP address, so we want, if we remember, we want to do dot seven through dot nine, right, because there's only three alive hosts that we found with the MBT scan. So, we're going to do 192.168.168. Uh, 1.7, we're going to start out with, 7, and then it's TAC, and you don't have to put a dot in here, you just have to put the last octet of the IP, so 7 through dot 9, so it's going to scan 192.168.1.7.8 and dot 9, okay? So now you do a space, and if you want to specify only certain ports or all ports to scan, by default, NMAP scans all the first 
1024 ports, okay? But to specify ports, you do the TAC lowercase p, and then if you only want to go after certain ports like 139, 445, so on and so forth, port 80, you do that here, and you separate them with commas. So 139, 445, 80, and they don't have to be in numerical order. That's the great thing. Okay, so you can do that if you wanted to, and you can specify as many in here as you want. Uh, just for this sake, I'm going to do, if you want to specify as a port range, like 1 through 80, you could do that by 1, TAC, 80. Okay, but we're just going to do 1, TAC, 1024. Even though that's the default, I just like to type it in anyway, just so I know for sure that it's being scanned. Okay. The great thing about Nmap is it, it does have the ability to export your results to an XML file. And what's good about that is there is a tool built into Kali uh, that comes with Kali that you can convert that XML file into an actual readable HTML file. And since Kali Linux uh, has Apache Web Server installed, all you'd have to do is start that, run this command, convert it. We're not actually going to go through that now. Um, we're actually just going to, going to append this to our results.txt file that we were working on, right? Because we want everything in one file so we can pick it apart later on. Okay, so we're going to do again the double greater than less than symbols because we're appending to the file right so if we we're just creating the file right off the beginning like we said you would just do one of the greater than less than signs okay so we want to do that to results.txt okay and it's always a good idea in nmap to use verberos as well so we can just put that before our a so it's tack lowercase v for verberos Okay, you can also issue a command inside here, a flag that uh, will update the stats every 10 seconds, 20 seconds, whatever you want to do, but we're not actually going to do that because we're only scanning three IP addresses, so it shouldn't take all that long. Okay, so let's just go ahead and hit enter. Now, you're not going to see any output coming to the screen because it's all going into the results.txt uh, file, right? So it's appending it to the end of the NBT scan results that were put in there initially. And again, it's very important to know because I know you guys are going to ask me this question. You have to use the double greater than less than symbols to append to the end of a file. Only use one when you want to begin a new file, right? So let's just give it a uh, few seconds here to complete. Uh, keep in mind it is doing one through one, uh, 1024 ports on each of the three hosts, so it may take a minute or two. Uh, again, if you're doing this over a WAN, it may take even longer, especially if you're doing it through proxies, uh, and we'll get into how to do that as well. It's going to take even longer, right? So the, the whole key to this game is to be patient, very patient. Don't get frustrated. Don't be like, you know, hey, it's not working right away. I give up. Stick with it. It takes a little while. Uh, and if you want to get good results, you'll wait around for it, right? So patience uh, is, is key here. Okay, so we see that the scan's completed, right? So now let's just take a look at our results file again. So cat results.txt. Well, hey, look at that. Here's some nmap uh, results here. And let's scroll all the way back up to the top so you can see that it actually appended. So now if you look here from, from this line down, so it's uh, the first thing that we put into here was the NBT scan results, right? So then we spaced it and appended starting nmap. Oops. And now you can go through this whole entire scan and look at it. So we can go ahead and see, and it's kind of hard to read it this way. So sometimes you may want to actually export this to an HTML so you can read it easier. And perhaps I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. So it says uh, doing an uh, ARP ping scan, okay? And then scanning three hosts, one port, one host. Completed ARP ping scan, okay? Three total hosts, so we know that we definitely have three online. Initializing, uh, parallel, initializing parallel DNS resolution of three hosts, and then going through it's doing a SYN scan, which is by default the scan that uh, NMAP performs. And if you know about the TCP um, stack, it, it there's a three-way handshake included in you know for all TCP connections. It's you know ACK, SYN, SYN, ACK, right? So uh, we can go into that if that if so, that's something that interests you guys. You don't know about it already. That's basic networking one on one. We can go through uh, you know different uh, protocols and things like that if you want. It's it's completely up to you. Uh, so just let me know in the forums and you know we'll, we'll work on that. Okay, so um, scanning three hosts. So then you can see it goes down and it does the host at random. It scans random ports on random hosts, right? So it's it's kind of hard to follow this way. It says discovered open port 53. TCP is a protocol on 192.168.1.9. Okay, so going down to the end here, uh, you know, this port uh, 445 on uh, 1.7, so on and so forth. 
Uh, so it's going to try to guess what operating systems are on these at the very end here. Okay. So it'll also tell you MAC addresses too. Of course, if you want to match that up with your NBT uh, scan results, you could do that as well. Okay, so it's going to say OS scan results may be unreliable because we could not find at least one open and one closed port. Now, that's the important thing. Nmap, in order to do an accurate uh, host discovery OS detection, needs one closed and one open port. Okay, so it's saying here that uh, one system is running Microsoft Windows uh, 7 Vista or 2008. And then, of course, we had a user uh, ask us a question about this whole CPE result thing. That's just part of what Nmap spits out. So, uh, but you can always see here where it just says running. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, scrolling down here, you can see that it's doing a bunch of different things. I mean, it, if you really wanted to take the time and read all this, you can. Um, it's going through what, how it did the OS discovery on this one particular host. Okay. So 1.7 was that host. So Nmap scan report for 192.168.1.8. We're going to go through and it's going to say, okay, well, it's got port 139 open. That's NetBIOS SSN. And it's got port 445 open and it's TCP and that's the Microsoft DS. And it says Microsoft XP, right? Or Windows XP. All right. Gives you the MAC address too. So again, you can verify that with the NBT scan results. And then it's going to tell you the OS scan result down below. So it's going to say running Microsoft Windows 2000 or XP. So if you look down further here on the OS CPE, you can see that uh, at some point it says here Microsoft Windows XP Service Pack 3. So again, going through all here, you can read this is Windows XP, okay? And the computer name is XP Pro 1, NetBIOS name is XP Pro 01 and domain name. So hey, no, we now know it's a uh, part of a domain, right? So it's part of Active Directory. So the SMB security mode, uh, it looks like we used a guest account for all this information gathering. Guest account should never be enabled, guys. We should all know that, right? So uh, now we're looking at the IP address 192.168.1.8. Okay, it looks like it's got port 53 open and it has port 80 open or I'm sorry, uh, 1.9, my mistake. Uh, it's got port 53 open, which we know is domain DNS, and it says Microsoft DNS. It's also got port 80 open. Hey, that's pretty interesting, right? Port 80 is always bad to have open. Okay, so uh, it's HTTP service, as we know, and it's running Microsoft IIS HTTPD version 6.0. That's bad. That's outdated, right? So uh, it also gives you HTTP methods. You got options, trace, get, head, copy, so on and so forth. Now that by, might be of interest to you if you're trying to do some sort of injection into, you know, the websites or something like that. Moving forward, um, you can see the other open ports it has here is 88, Kerberos, uh, Windows 2003 Kerberos, okay. So then it's got, uh, you know, your NetBIOS ports open here, 135, 139. Hey, look, it's got an LDAP port open too for that Active Directory stuff, right? So it says port 445, Microsoft DS, Microsoft Windows 2003 or 2008. Like I said, most of the back end stuff in Active Directory is about the same. Okay, so uh, it looks like port 464 is open for K password 5. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. You might want to take note of that for later. So going forward here, we're not going to go through all these open ports. Uh, it says Microsoft Windows XP or 2003. Okay, well, let's read down a little bit further here. And it says OS details, XP Service Pack 2 or Service Pack 3 or Windows Server 2003. Since they pretty much use the same kind of underlying technology in the kernel, it's kind of hard to guess, right? So uh, let's go take a look at some more information. Well, it says the names, Acme Inc. PDC. Okay, so we could probably surmise there that that's a primary domain controller. But let's take a look at the SMB OS discovery, right? It's Windows Server 2003, Windows Server 2003 version 5.2. Now, in this, it doesn't tell us how how much percentage sure, it's sure of that. Uh, if you were to pipe this out to the XML file and convert that to an HTML file, you'd see that it you know will guess 100%, 100%, 100%, 95%, so on and so forth. Okay, so um, all right, so we know that all that information is true. Now. Here's the thing, if you want to use Nmap to import the results from Nmap into 
things like Armitage. You would probably want to pipe this out, the results out to its own separate file, right? An XML file, for instance. So let's just give a brief rundown of how that actually works. Using the same nmap command, okay, instead of piping it out to results.txt, we're actually going to do a little different thing here. There's a couple of flags included in the nmap where you can actually pipe it out to an XML file, right? So that command or that flag is tac lowercase o capital X and then the name of the file, but it has to end in .xml. So we're just going to do nmap .xml, right? The other thing too is if you don't want to sit here and look at a blank screen, you kind of want to see something to entertain you as the scan's going along. You could do the update stats command, but again, this is um, not something we're going to do here. Okay, so let's go ahead and just hit enter. Okay. So it's going to scroll past the screen here. Of course, again, it's you know giving you the information on the screen here. Um, but if you didn't want to sit here and watch you know hundreds of things scroll by, you just want to see an update every 10 seconds to make sure it's still working. There would be that uh, it's tac tac stats tac update uh, or every stats or tac tac stats tac uh, every and then space 10 seconds or something like that. Um, if you want an example, uh, take a look at the other video uh, that we did, the teaser trailer, Hacking for Fun and Profit, and you can see me do the command in there. I can't remember off the top of my head, and guys, you probably won't remember all these commands off the top of your head either, so maybe keep a little notepad by your desk or you know, a text file on your desktop or something like that. Uh, I don't, just because I know when I need it, I actually just look at the help file or the man pages, and I will figure it out. So anyway, let's just give it here another few minutes for it to complete. And then I'm going to show you how to convert this XML file into the uh, HTML output file and then use the built-in Apache server to actually view it. Okay, so now it's it's done, right? So we can see that we have the nmap.xml file here if we ls on the directory, right? So it'll list all the files. And we still have our results.txt. Okay, so that's good. So you may want to do this both ways. It's really up to you guys. Um, sometimes people are more understanding of visual stuff and, and that's the case for me on some things too so I don't blame you if you want to do it this way so uh, to, to convert the XML file into a HTML file there's a program built in like I said it's XSL tproc okay so you can always use just type in XSL and hit the tab key for autocomplete so the way to use this is your input file which is nmap.xml okay and then you gotta do tac lowercase o for output and where do you want to output it? Well, Apache um, web directory or the web service directory is in forward slash var forward slash www, right? So I want to just output this to there. I don't want to have to keep moving this thing around, so on and so forth. I want to save myself a little bit of time, right? So it's forward slash var forward slash www, and then we have to give it a name. So this one we're just going to name nmap.html, and it's important you have to put the .html at the end. Okay, so that completed. So in this case, I already have Apache started, but if you wanted to, let me just shut it down first. And then I'll show you. Okay, so if you want to start Apache, it's basically service, Apache, and you use autocomplete, of course, like I always do, Apache 2, and then start, right? So it'll say the server started, it's listening on your local host, okay? So just fire up a web browser. Okay, so we're gonna go to 127.0.0.1 and then our file, which is nmap.html, oops. Okay, so now you can see we got a pretty graphical interface here to look at what we scanned and what we did. So of course scan summary, these are all clickable links if you want to just go to a certain IP address, so on and so forth. And the reason why I want to show you this is it's, you know, just gives you a graphical interface to look at the results instead of digging through a text file like we just did. But as time wears on, I'm sure you're going to want to save time, right? Because in any industry, time is money, especially labor related stuff like we're doing. Um, so, you know, you may just want to get used to reading it through a text file. Okay. But again, if you want to import into other applications, you know you should write it to its own separate text file. Okay. 
So anyway, looking at this, uh, just to give you a brief overview, it's going to tell you the IP address up here, and it's going to tell you what ports are open down here. And of course, it puts it in a nice table format to give you something to look at that's uh, nice. And then, of course, when you look at uh, remote operating system detection, it's going to say used port 135 TCP open, and that's how it's going to guess. Uh, Microsoft Windows 7 Professional 100%. Well, we actually know it's Ultimate, but it's still Windows 7 Professional. And then it's going to say Microsoft Windows Vista, Service Pack 0, Service Pack 1, Windows Server 2008. It's going to say 100%. Now, sometimes, guys, these, these guesses can be wrong. So keep that in mind, right? Because it's just using basic identification, right? So, uh, you know, again, this shows all this inter interesting information that we've seen inside the text file. So uh, if you want to read through this, you could if you wanted to do this for further analysis. But uh, we know what we're up against now. We read the text file. We had it all included. We're going to stick with that. Okay, so let me just get out of here. Okay, let's clear out this screen. So the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to actually want to check these hosts for any vulnerabilities. So we're going to use OpenVos 6 to do that. And you... I'm sure you've seen the video, uh, the OpenVos 6 uh, installation and configuration demo that we did. We did a, a demo scan in there. So uh, I also wrote that script for you guys, OpenVos Startup, as you can see here on my desktop. And of course, you can download that from our website, learnnetsec.com, if you haven't already. Okay. And uh, you can look at our demo video on the script as well. Just make sure there's no nasty bad stuff in there. That's going to hurt your system. Okay. So anyway, uh, I want to go back to the root directory. And I want to go into the desktop. Okay. And then I just want to go into the OpenVos setup script, right? Because this is much easier than starting up each individual service, then issuing the update commands. This, this is why I wrote the script. It automatically does it for you. So in order to do that, uh, just uh, go ahead and fire off the OpenVos-start.sh script. And if you've been following along, it's always uh, period forward slash OpenVos dash start dot sh right and it's going to go ahead and check updates uh, if you're out of date which you should be updating your stuff every day anyway even if you're not doing any vulnerability assessments it's just going to save you time when you're actually live on site or live doing a, an audit somewhere else okay so um it's going to take a few minutes here for it to do its thing check its updates make sure it's all updated all that good stuff and then it's going to start up the Greenbone Security Assistant uh, web UI for us. And remember, in the other videos, when you set it up initially, you created a username uh, or a password. I should say the default username is admin. And then you created a password, so you're going to log in. But this script automatically launches the web UI interface for you. So that's good. Okay, guys, so now we're going to log into our web interface here. Okay, so now that we're logged into our web interface, let me just uh, go ahead and get rid of this scan here. Okay, so now that we're logged into our web interface, we want to, and, and if you saw the other video, if not, please go back and reference that, the OpenVos uh, setup um, stuff. So what we need to do first is we need to go ahead and add in a target, right? So to add a target, of course, we always click the little uh, blue box here with the star in it at the top. So we're going to name this um, something that we can familiarize ourselves with and easily call back to it. So this one we're just going to name Acme Inc. Okay. So now you can import the host from a file if you wanted to, or you can do it manually. Okay. So I'm going to do it manually here. 192.168.1.0, and then we're just going to do 24. Now, in order to save yourself some time, if you wanted to, you can enter these in. Um, from a text file if you wanted to. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and set it off as a scan like that. Um, comment optional, you can just put uh, internal, you know, audit or external if it was external, but just something to reference it to. Uh, port list, uh, you can choose from the options down here. Um, we're just going to do, you know, we don't want to do all ports because that's going to take forever. Uh, we just want to do all privilege TCP and go ahead and hit create target. Now, of course, you can see we have them in here, right? And there's 255 IPs in there. So now we want to go to create a scan management task to actually kick off the scan. And of course, as always, the little blue box with the uh, uh, star in it. And now, of course, we're just going to call this Acme Inc. again. And we're just going to put in uh, first internal scan. 
And if you wanted to, you can reference a, a date and time, but it will also automatically write it out for you in the results. So um, let's go ahead and make sure your scan targets is set on the correct one, Acme Inc., right? And then go ahead and create task. Okay, so you can see here we have a new task. Status says new. Uh, we want to probably go up here if we want to keep an eye on it. Just uh, set uh, refresh every 30 seconds and click this uh, little refresh button up here so it actually applies. Now to kick off the scan, just hit the uh, start button up here. And the scan here should say requested. And when it does refresh here in 30 seconds, it should say that it started and it should give you a progress meter at some point. Uh, as it's going through. In fact, I'm just going to set this here to 10 seconds just so we can see what's going on. Okay, so it's at 1% now. Now, of course, keep in mind, this is going to scan all the IP addresses in that range. So this is going to take a while for us. Uh, like I said, if you wanted to input those IP addresses manually, just pop them into a text file, the alive host, and then import it into here, and it'll only scan those three hosts. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video here, take a few minutes break. When this scan can, uh, finishes, I'll come back and then we'll discuss the uh, results. We'll discuss how to export them as a PDF, and then we'll go forward from there. Okay, guys, we're back. Um, so we got our results, but uh, I did make a mistake earlier. There is a simplified way that you can enter in just the IPs that you want to scan inside of uh, OpenVos Greenbone Security Assistant. And if you notice that when we went up to the targets, when we created our target, uh, you notice that we put in all of the IP addresses in the slash 24 CIDR. However, you can actually uh, enter in the individual IP addresses. It's something I went ahead and did during the break while we were waiting for scan results to, you know, complete. Um, so let's just go through that quickly just to show you. So I just want to add a new target. I'm just going to name this test for now. Okay, so the host, when you do manual, you can do, well, much like we did in NMAP or NBT scan, uh, no, I'm sorry, NMAP, uh, you can do individual host range, right? So uh, 192.168.1 and then we want to start off with dot seven and then again it's dash and you don't have to put in a dot nine right so as you can see it's already in their autocomplete here but uh, that's the way you would do it okay so you're only scanning those three IP addresses that we know that we are definitely after and we're not scanning all of you know the IPs that belong in there that are dead and there's no host on them so that's just to save you some time and then of course uh, with the ports. If you want to just choose the first 1024 ports, uh, it's all IANA assigned TCP ports, right? Okay, so let's, um, let's forget about that and let's go back to our actual scan and read the results. So now, of course, whenever you want to go to the reports, you click on the date right here, right? So that's going to bring us into another screen here, and that's going to show us our results page. So we want a full report, of course, always, right? We don't want to just do, you know, some reports and whatever. We want the whole thing. And again, uh, in the forums, I'm going to, I think I already did, but if not, I, if I haven't already, I'm going to write up a quick uh, thing on how to install uh, the, the PDF functionality so you can uh, export it as PDF. But uh, from your options here for download, you have everything from ARF type file, CPA, HTML. You can download it to a text file if you wanted to, if you want to incorporate this now into our original results.txt that we were working off of. Um, but for just to show you, I'm just going to export it as a PDF. Okay, so then uh, we can just open this up with Document Viewer or we can save the file. So you know what, we might as well just save it. We're going to save it over. Uh, we want to save it into where we were working out of the Acme Inc. folder, right? And uh, we're just going to name this. Uh, See, so yeah, the default uh, report name and all that stuff here. We're just going to name this Acme dash Inc. and then dash report, right? And you could put the date in here if you really wanted to. Um, you know, if you want to put in like uh, July dash 05 dash 13 for 2013 right that's today so just uh, go ahead and click save and of course from here you can actually just open it if you wanted to um, that's what I'm going to go ahead and do from our downloads menu here from iSweasel much the same as Firefox Google Chrome same thing okay so it's just my machine's lagging a little bit here the, the VM's actually lagging a little bit so it's going to take just a moment here to open up let's just uh, get rid of all this and here we go I apologize for the lag. I, I didn't really allocate too much resources to uh, this file. Um, 
So we have an index here as well that you can go through if you wanted to just to easily go down to an IP address and then you go to your medium and your high priorities and stuff like that. So it's going to take just a moment here to uh, get going. Now, the thing I noticed about OpenBoss and Greenbone Security System, the web UI, it kind of slows things down. It's very resource intensive. So be aware of that. Uh, if you have this on a dedicated machine like a laptop or something that you're taking you know, with you to sites uh, or a dedicated physical machine that you're using in your you know, office uh, to do your remote scans, of course, make sure you have as much resources as possible, memory you know, and all that stuff. Okay, so anyway, looking at the scan report, you can see that this builds a pretty decent report right off the bat right so for your vulnerability assessment this is kind of like an out of the box report so you really up above here if you want to edit the PDF file in like open office or something you can put your logo and contact info up here anyway scrolling down uh, you can see it gives us a good content table so we don't got to make that that's really cool and it's clickable as well when you're looking at the PDF so um, you can see that it goes from medium uh, to low generals uh, stuff like that um, you can see that there's another medium in here and then now you can see that there's high right on 1.9, which we know is our primary domain controller, which is also has port 80 open, so it's it's running a, you know a web server of some type. So let's just choose this one and click on it. So now you can go down here, and your client may not be interested in looking at this specifically, especially the the higher ups in the company, the the IT manager. He may be interested in reading this because it's kind of technical information. Uh, and this is what we'll put in our brief overview when we actually build a case file. So Basically, it says hi, and then it gives you the CVSS um, reference to it. Uh, and then also, it's, you know, you just read down here, overview, the host is running Microsoft IIS web server with the web dev module or web dev module, and is prone to remote authentication bypass vulnerability, vulnerability insight due to the wrong implementation, so on and so forth. You get the idea. And, and basically, if you scroll down to the next page here, because it continues, it'll give you all of the technical information included and in the CVS and it'll also give you some reference links too so this is something that you want to include in your report all the reference links for each CVS um, uh, this way you can give it to the IT guy and he can actually look it over and go to those links and be like oh well hey here's my fix but it kinda tells you the workaround and it just says disable web Dave or upgrade to Microsoft IIS, uh, IIS 7.0 so of course that's what the guy would basically have to do. So in short, you know, you tell him, look, either disable WebDAV if you don't need it or upgrade to IIS 7.0. Pretty much it, right? So uh, look down another one, uh, another high one, Microsoft DS port 445. This host is missing a critical security update according to the Microsoft Bulletin MS09-001. Now it's important because when you're using, and we will get to this in the next uh, video, because this one's running way too long already as it is, uh, when we get into using Metasploit and Armitage, you, these are going to be important, the MS09-001, because we're going to look for that vulnerability, and then we're going to fire it at the target after we check it and verify it, right? So again, you can read through all this. The host is running, uh, our host is missing a critical security update. Uh, it continues on the next page. It tells you the affected uh, system software and OS. Microsoft Win 2K, uh, XP Service Pack 3 and prior, and Windows Server 2003 Service Pack 2 and prior. Well, our um, Windows Server 2003 box is just default out of the box, no updates applied, right? And you'll be surprised at systems administrators on how they do not update their server software because they are afraid that an update, and it's known to happen, it's, it's common, but as an update might break the system. And Microsoft is well known for breaking systems with updates. Um, so, you know, basically you can go down, there's another one here, Microsoft Windows SMB server, multiple vulnerabilities, and it gives you another Microsoft Security Bulletin number, MS10012, and then it gives you, again, CVS score, um, and then, it, of course, once you scroll down here, it tells you what's affected, and it gives you the references, and it tells you the fixes to run Windows Update. So this is important, like I said, to give to the IT guy that's in charge of fixing all this, and make sure that they, they sign a copy and you sign a copy, and you both retain a copy signed by each other, right? So you sign and they sign one copy, you give it to them, and then you photocopy that or whatever, and you keep another copy for yourself, right? So this way, if they try to ever blame something on you, like, hey, you never let us know about this, and hey, you know, we don't know how to fix it. Uh, you never gave us any references that's a lie because here it is and you signed off on it right so just it's always about covering your own butts guys seriously that the end game is always to cover your own butt all right so um 
you can go down and look at medium reports. Uh, you know, it gives it a CVS score of 5.0. Um, you know, and again, it'll just tell you what it's all about, uh, and it'll tell you why and what's involved and what the fixes are and the references and all that good stuff. Okay, so um, and it basically says for this one, a solution is to filter the incoming traffic to this port. Well, no kidding. If this port was available from outside on the WAN, that's a problem, right? So uh, obviously that's not the case here. This is this is internal. So notice that when you do internal audits, you're going to get a lot more results. But as long as they're not accessible from the outside world for the most part, you're okay. But it's still an issue that needs to be talked about or addressed on the internal network. Okay, so they'll have to figure out whatever they need to figure out in order to, you know, solve this on the internal network itself, right? Because if we have one compromised host on that LAN, guess what? We're firing exploits against all these machines that are coming up in, in our summary right here, and we're going to own those boxes and keep owning them and owning them, set up pivots and own other boxes, and before you know it, we have the whole network under our thumb, and that's a bad thing for them, right? So um, so that's basically how to read this report, guys. Um, I'm not going to, we're, we're really running out of time here. We're definitely over an hour. I am not going to get into Metasploit in this video. I'm going to create a separate video to import uh, stuff into Armitage. We are going to do it both ways, okay? Because I think it's important to know both ways on how to use Metasploit. We've briefly went over Armitage before, uh, and we have never went over the actual MSF console. Now, before Armitage and other, uh, you know, user interfaces or GUIs came out for Metasploit, it was just command line only. So there's a lot more options in command line, and I want to show you how that works through command line so you know how the underlying stuff is actually working. And then we'll use Armitage because it's a, you know, graphical user interface and a lot of people like that. And hey, I'm not opposed to it either, uh, but it does lack some features and some features are a little confusing. Whereas when you're using the command line, the MSF console, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, we'll go through it both ways, like I said, so this way you have an understanding of what's going on. Uh, and it'll actually, the MSF console uh, underlying understandings will apply to Armitage and some of the options set up in those exploits. So you'll have a good working idea of how to use both. And sometimes you may have to fall back on just using MSF console, right? I've experienced it a couple times where, and I, it's not Armitage's fault, but I experienced it a couple times where, you know, Armitage wasn't working exactly the way that it needed to. But I was able to accomplish the same task using MSF console, right? And and I've been using MS, MSF console for forever. So I'm really familiar with that. I'm going to break it down into simplistic terms and show you guys how to use that too. All right. So uh, basically today we went through uh, enumeration on the network, okay, uh, emulating a internal audit. Uh, we went through, you know, the various uh, steps of not only enumerating all the live hosts on the network, but doing a port scan against them, enumerating operating systems and services. Then we went ahead and uh, also did a vulnerability assessment against those live hosts with those open ports. Okay, so we pretty much triple checked everything. Uh, one last thing I want to show you before you go is I want to show you how to actually check uh, with Telnet. Okay, uh, and we're going to use the Windows Domain Controller because it's a HTTP service that's running on it. So we're going to—that's the easiest one to enumerate. So we're going to show you how to do that. Let me um, just get out of here and uh, clear this and CD to root. Just I always like working out of my root directory. Okay, so um, basically, if you find an open port like, say for instance, port 80, okay. You always want to tell them that into it and try to do a banner grab. And this is what we used to do back in the day before port scanners were like so intuitive and so like on point to tell you what's running on that port, right? So we want to make sure that they weren't spoofing services. And it used to be back in the day, like in, a, in Apache and things like that, you can actually modify the files and spoof what results are printed out to you. So instead of saying Apache version 1.3, it would say like, none of your damn business go away <laughs> was one of my favorite ones to use to uh, spoof my Apache servers that I was running. Okay. So um, taking the IP address 192.168.1.9, which we knew was from our NMAP results and MBT scan results and the, um, and the results from OpenVOS, we were able to determine that that's definitely a Windows server running some sort of web server on it, on port 80, right? So you always telnet space the IP address or the domain name in some cases, uh, and then the port. By default, telnet uses port 23, but that port was not open in any of our scans, so we want to telnet to port 80. Now you're going to get a blank screen in some cases here, so you need to type in get 
space, so it doesn't matter what you put in here, right? HTTP space colon, blah, blah, blah. it doesn't matter. You're just trying to get results, okay? So if you actually did the get command correctly, you would see that it would say like Microsoft IIS, uh, you know, version 6.0. The other way to do that too, in some cases, uh, you can open up a web browser and you can browse over to there. So we'll just do 192. Uh, dot 168.1.9 and we know port 80 is open so we'll go over there and it says look oh future intranet site of Acme Inc but what happens if sometimes you can enter in a error page and just make something up like error.html and look it'll tell you some information right so it says page cannot be found okay it's a default and it says internet information services IIS so we know it's definitely running an IIS server Right? So that's just one of the ways to actually verify that. But 9 out of 10 times, guys, you can go by what Nmap says because it's usually right. Um, there's also other tricks to uh, get service versions and things like that. Telnet's just one of them. You know, Nmap, of course, uh, going to, you know, like on a web server type deal, going to a bogus page. You know, an FTP server, you would Telnet into the FTP server, uh, you know, stuff like that, just to get a banner grab going on. Um, there actually might even be a tool inside Kali Linux to do it. Um, if there's not, maybe I'll even write one. I don't know. But uh, needless to say, guys, the video is definitely overrun by long. I had to do a lot of editing. So I'm going to let you guys go, and I will see you in the next video where, again, we are going to discuss using Metasploit and Armitage to exploit systems that are vulnerable according to the results of our scans. All right, guys, take care. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.